focus. Click the links for Odyssey, BHG, join Telegram, or support channel and the various other links. Uh, you know, this kind of reminds me, uh, Wheel of Time. What happened to the Wheel of Time? It doesn't seem like anyone's talking about it. I'm sure, I'm sure it's just fantastic. Uh, I haven't managed to catch any episodes. <laughs> Because I saw the I saw the photos that came out for Wheel of Time. Uh, it looked like cancer, so I I skipped that one. But if you've seen it, tell me. Uh, let me know how much you enjoy it. I'm sure it's doing fantastic. Okay, so the thing with the Hobbit or the Lord of the Rings that keeps coming out is um, as they release more production, more globalist propaganda for the show. You got a lot of normie people who are at the center of the bell curve, political bell curve for Lord of the Rings. Even some people who are to the left of center uh, who are looking at this and saying, yeah, this isn't Lord of the Rings. But they're in a tough spot because for them to speak out uh, against it is it, it's tricky for them. So that, you know, Couch is like, oh, well, you're not really following the artistic vision. Instead of like, you should just come out and say it's cancer. Like, oh, diversity is so important. No, follow the artistic vision. If you want something different, if you want uh, BLT Afro Hobbits, just write something new. Uh, but we can't write because we're parasites and parasites can't create. Yeah, that's kind of what it boils down to. So you're putting these normies in in a kind of a tricky position with Lord of the Rings, which is it's funny because Lord of the Rings is obviously much bigger name recognition than the Wheel of Time. That I think people have already forgot about. I think that's Amazon Wheel of Time. Well, people have already forgot about. So Lord of the Rings is going to have a bigger... I think it comes out in, I don't know, a couple months. It's going to have a bigger first episode for sure. And first season? Um, maybe? Uh, I don't know. The thing is, I'm assuming the issue is, well, how many new subscribers will it get? How many people will look at these... Um, these images and decide that they need to sign up and pay for a subscription service. Like, he's just going to get, there's a lot of Lord of the Rings fans out there because the, the, the four primary books were of course fantastic. And there's something I reread every few years because they're that good. And, uh, you know, if I'm going to say I'm not a purist. I, I saw the movies. I thought the movies were even better than the books because they taught you how to pronounce the names. And if I don't know how to pronounce the, if I don't like knowing the lexicon and the nomenclature of a story is very important. And if I'm reading the books, I didn't know how to pronounce these names. I just kind of had to guess and it didn't really click in my head until I saw the movies. And then they pronounce the names. I was like, Oh, okay. Now I'm able to map the story better in my mind. And plus you see like the image, the graphical representation of the character. So you can map it down to the story. And, and also that, that movie came out, I think 2003, it was pretty tight to the story itself. I think there was only one scene that kind of went off script a little bit that I didn't, I didn't even pay attention to at the time where uh, they're crossing the river. Uh, and um, that was the one scene that deviated from the story. But like even in the story it's, itself, like they're trying to make a movie of it, they're realizing like, yeah, this is all guys. Like the whole story is, because, you know, it's loosely influenced by his World War One telling. So it's like there's way... Way too much cock in the story, <laughs> like with the uh, the early Batman, they had to bring in some chicks. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of dudes living together. It's a little bit creepy. Um, so I understand that for the for the vision of this, the movie, you're gonna have to bring in some women to kind of lighten up, uh, feminize the movie a little bit, and it worked. Yeah, like it totally worked. And obviously, like the one scene, there's someone on Twitter was strawmanning this argument where she says, "I am no man," and she stabs the demon, and and the guy goes, "Oh, the chats today would be so outraged. You couldn't even do this." And people in the comments are like. That was in the book. What are you talking about? You don't. Either you haven't read the book, you don't know what you're talking about. So I'm seeing a lot of people who are very concerned with seeing uh, Afro hobbits in the stories or Asian hobbits and all this other kind of stuff in the stories. And then you kind of go through their comments, you realize, like, well, you haven't read the book, have you? Or any of the books? Well, well, no, but I want to see. I want to see diversity as our strength in the stories. Yeah, maybe read the books first. And then, to be fair, there are other POCs that are going, hey, I'm, listen, I'm a POC. I want to see the stories as written. And uh, there's a, like there's a, all this, these little, um, this thing down here, that's the hidden replies. And there's, you know, thousands of hidden replies by uh, Amazon or Netflix or whatever. Um, by people who are, and the thing is, a lot of the names are from uh, POC names. People who are, um, there's a lot of Arab and Spanish names. People who are saying, listen, we want to see the stories 
as he wrote them. Maintain the artistic vision. And <laughs> Hollywood is giving these people the, the big middle, middle finger. And then someone also raised a very good point about the Afro-Hobbit genocide. Because <laughs> they're showing a bunch of people who um, were in a prequel. And then kind of magically, it's like, well, what happened to these people? They're not represented in the movies that came out 20 years ago. Um, they were like the ant wives, maybe. They just went off on some mystery. <laughs> or or I don't know what happened to them. They, some some, some uh, ethnic cleansing happened, I guess. The, the hidden tale that Tolkien didn't tell you, how they ethnically cleansed the, um, the, uh, the Afro-Hobbits, I guess. It's a lot of hot words for, uh, for YouTube. Anyway, so um, first of all, you can't appease these people. Um, there's a guy on Bounty in the Comics. This guy, uh, Dan Sludge, his argument is that if you don't accept a, um, a complete rewriting uh, of this Afro-Hobbit story in Lord of the Rings, then you, sir, you, my good man, are istophobic. you got to stop trying to argue with these people on their terms, which I know is kind of hard for the, the middle-of-the-road people. They feel like all this makes a lot of normies uncomfortable because you're arguing about issues that... that um, the West has been brainwashed into believing through the past 80 years. But, you know, you got to leave your comfort zone to argue with these people because they're very, very bad people. You can reject some terms right from the start. That istophobic term is a control term that globalists use to manipulate the cattle who nobody really, like most people go out of their way to avoid conflict, but that, that's going to have to end. The thing is, does it have a meaning? Yeah, allegedly it means a superior group based on immutable uh, genetic characteristics. But the way that these parasites use it is simply to manipulate people who don't want to have an argument about it. And, you know, now in current years, like you're having an argument about it on on um, Twitter. Um, is this your employer? It's like, oh, I can't I can't argue about maintaining the artistic vision of Lord of the Rings without being doxxed, fired and destroyed. It's like, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of where we've come with this social pressure. Uh, you know, and all this stuff is kind of deck chairs on the Titanic until the uh, the Civil War or whatever, whatever's going to happen. Anyway, so Lord of the Rings is a European story, mostly an English story. Like, uh, Tolkien was not shy about giving interviews and talking about how he crafted his stories. It was mostly, you know, English, but you could see that it was also, he was also able to incorporate other parts of Europe. There are parts that felt, you know, Scandinavian and then Mediterranean and Eastern Europe, that kind of stuff. It's like you could very easily overlay Europe into his story universe. Um, it's a story that's got strong elements of, I guess, Euro tribalism of, of nation. It's, um, it's still tribalism. It's unique, distinct tribes of people. What happens is these globalist vermin who make shows, they hate nationalism. But travel stories work. You know, we did something because we're Englishmen fighting for England or hobbits, as the case may be. See, I mean, they do things like they call you istophobic and they're kind of hoping that that will stop the argument. You have to say, well, let's um, that doesn't go to the heart of the argument. Let's let's go to this. Does this maintain the artistic vision? Is it what the artist would have wanted? Is it a fair rendition of the spirit of the story? It's like just calling each other istophobic is um, you're, you're deflecting away from the original argument. And like these people hate that because they've cre they've built these shields and then they build these shields so so they can manipulate you with this language. The problem with globalism in stories or in the real world is that if a few dwarves live among the hobbits, then I mean they're not hobbits; they'll never be hobbits. The hobbits want to maintain the hobbit way of life, but the dwarves want to be dwarves. They can't be anything else. So you're kind of setting the system up to fail the story universe up to fail or if they interbreed well the new dwarf hobbits is a member of no tribe they i mean you can incorporate that into a tri into a story um but you know at the the point zero they're nothing who do they fight for if there's a conflict they can never kind of be trusted and i know that that's a little base for lord of the rings and youtube but like all these fictional stories are overlaid from their influence from real stories you know Real world verisimilitude is reflected in these stories. It's why some stories work and others don't. It's why nationalism works for storytelling and globalism fails. Like it just feels wrong. It doesn't fit in with our learned human experience of you know different tribes are in constant conflict. Humans are tribal, and to de to de deny that just creates failure. It, you know whether it's a story universe or not. 
and part of the current conflict is, uh, you know, with hobbits and dwarves, um, speaking the truth isn't istophobic. you got to kind of get beyond that of, like, shutting down as soon as they raise that term. And, in fact, denying the European story is istophobic against Europeans. So uh, this sledge people, uh, these are master manipulators. If you make a hobbit village with Euro, Afro, and Asian, you destroy the willing suspension of, dis- suspension of disbelief. It's just a Hollywood purse puppy checklist. It's not a tribe. It's a collection of different people. Why are they living together, and what is their unifying force? And the reason the real hobbits all look English is because they are a people, a tribe unified by blood. Why are they living with people who are not their tribe? It doesn't make any sense. Tribes are not insular. They do a nice way of saying uh, kidnap women is they do take women from other tribes, um, but they take women from tribes of the greater tribal family. A little more genetic diversity i.e. a Viking taking women from England, but they're not going all the way to Africa to kidnap women. Why why would they go so far physically, geographically, and why would they go so far out out of their tribe? The next part is, after they politely steal these women and, you know, struggle snuggle snuggle them, I mean, that's kind of the history of life on Earth, is they make them their wives and they have kids who pretty much look like them. You're going to have some, you know, genetic drift, but... It, they're still going to have light hair, light eyes. They're still within the greater European family or the Hobbit family, if you want to stay within that story universe. If they intermarried with dwarves, their offspring would be some new tribe. They would be kind of a lost race starting at ground zero. They've got no history, no culture. You would have to, after like a thousand years, if they were left alone, yeah, they would be something new. And then they would all look alike. They would share features because they've been they would start this new tribe of shared features. But why more Lord of the modern Lord of the Rings, a lot of Lord of the cultural Marxist rings fails is because you have a group of people, different people who don't interbreed. They're <clears throat> kind of like, um, I don't know, African, distinctly African, Asian, European. So why would they live together? People hate each other. People fight intra tribe, much less inter tribe. As a story element, it's instantly it's an instant failure, and the only reason they do it is to destroy anything European. If you speak like this, you're probably a giant bleeding pussy. And actually, the guy who wrote this article. He's got all kinds of mental health issues, and it's just like let him write the articles and just kind of stand back and you know hope he doesn't go postal at the office. Um, the soy boys like listening to people spurg out on Twitter. I, and I get and I, on and off Twitter like every six months or every year. I'll, I'll get on it for a couple of weeks and then get off it for like six months. And it's Twitter is so toxic. The left wing, alt left hatred on Twitter is insane. But I will say that there is kind of a based resurgence um, that's arising on Twitter. I don't know how these people are so based on Twitter. I think they're just going through a lot of burner uh, cell phone accounts. And the one of the defense of these soy boys on Twitter is they say it's a fantasy, it doesn't matter, but it's Tolkien's artistic vision. Why don't these Hollywood parasites just create something new? Well, they don't have an answer to that. Uh, and the, the truth is, like, they they can't. Like, his, like he's, Tolkien's not Tolkien's not the first guy to create a fantasy universe. He's distinctly taking elements from earlier fantasy, even some of the names of the characters. I, I got into this when I was, I don't know, a couple, de- couple decades ago. I was, I was rereading the stories. And even like Shadow Facts and the names of other characters are taken from earlier fantastic elements. And the thing that, that uh, Tolkien did was the earlier fantasy stories were too fantastic. They were too too many magical fairies and you know wood nymphs and midsummer's night dream type of stuff it was too fantastic where what he did was root it you know like based on world war ii loosely in there was very little magical elements it's what um terry pratchett did very successfully was it's set in a magic world but there's very little magic in it because it's too much um, um deus ex machina you know, you paint yourself into a corner with magic. It's like they're just they're just using magic to do everything. It, it it's hard to get involved in that story. So Pratchett and, and Tolkien did the same thing. It's like it's a magical setting, and there are fantastic creatures in it, but they're not doing a whole lot of magic. Like even the dragon in the first story is you know barely in the story. It's just a it's just a structure to tell groups of men 
um, who have to overcome, you know, issues. It overcome, it's a classic adventure story. It's a little bit less than a classic adventure story because it's not, I don't think there's much of a boy meets girl, but it's, you go out on an adventure, you mature. And like one of the, the first things in the first Lord of the Rings is when, I think they did it in the movie too, as well as the book, when he's saying this interesting point, they're talking about skipping, they're joking about skipping breakfast. And uh, he's explaining that like hobbits may be, you know, used to a life of ease, but they're also very much okay with getting on board something that requires some sacrifice. And uh, the main hobbit is saying, like, I suspect we're all going to be tightening our belts as we go through this adventure. Like, yeah, they're going to be walking nonstop, but they're also going to be eating less and they're going to be skipping meals and skipping meals. And, you know, you, like you see people who go off to any kind of, not modern war so much, but ancient war, like you got guys who are going off to war at 180 pounds and they're coming back at like 160 pounds. There's no fat on them, just lean and mean fighting machines. Because there's, you know, skipping a whole lot of meals. And, like, The Hobbit, that was an interesting forecasting for the story when he says, I suspect we're going to be tightening our belt. Like, they all knew that they were in for some tough times. Like, the four hobbits set off in this story and then on this tale. And it's like, yeah, I mean, they're going to walk quite a distance and they're going to face some very... Like, they knew what they were getting in for. And it was, God, it was such a powerful story. And then you do this this retelling and you, you like you remove the European elements of the story, and it's just fantasy. It's just fantasy. No, it's a complete universe, and it's distinctly European. You have to respect that. If you, you're talking about cultural appropriation and istophobicism, well, what do you call it when you destroy the culture of the English people and the greater European family? It's like that's kind of a story genocide. Anyway, like, comment, subscribe. I hope this wasn't too base for YouTube, and I will see you guys all next episode.